Hi, I'm Connor Kerr Lewis. I'm a video producer. I'm from New Zealand. And today we're going to be talking about how to make a short film. So what is a short film? A short film is just a story start to finish told in video. It's like a feature film, but it's maybe five to 20 minutes. But when the viewer watches it, they're only seeing this world. And this story is inside of this world, inside of this time frame. The viewer has to see that story and nothing else. Short film is not a scene in a feature film. In a feature film, the scene is part of many, many other scenes. But in a short film, it is a scene. And because it's so short, it could be a scene inside of many, many other scenes, but it's not. It has to be this one story that's very easy to understand for the viewer. And maybe it's cryptic, but it also has to just be that small story. A short film usually, traditionally, was used as a lower budget option for filmmakers. So you still have the same genres of storytelling that you have in a feature length film. But what you usually find with um, short films is it's more uh, personal uh, story driven through people because filmmakers have the option to do storytelling with their friends. But that doesn't mean to say that you're not going to find an action, uh, an experimental film. Yeah, like I said, the only constraints is really the time. If, if, if a short film is 40 minutes, it's not really a short film anymore. Okay, so a short film is not a documentary. It's not a music video. It is just a story. It's like a it's a it's a narrative. It's not like a diegetic real life capturing of something like a documentary is. Um, but it could be a musical, like a music video. Um, but yeah, those are the different types of short films, and maybe there's something else in there as well. So how do you make a short film? Well. I can just run you through the stages first. So we have the development stage, the pre-production, the production, the post-production, and the distribution. The beginning, the development stage is where you yourself getting a script. If you're gonna be the director, you need to have a script, or you're writing a script. And this, this part is great because you're testing your ideas with people and you're saying like, does this make sense? Are people gonna watch this film and think that I'm crazy? Um, no, maybe yes, let's change that, let's change that. But what you do is you, you, you want to run that script, <laughs> I don't know, 50 times. You want to read that script over and over again until you understand it. If you didn't write it, you need to really understand the script. So making things like a mood board before you make the shot list or the storyboard can be very useful. Now, when you make a mood board, you need to think of your characters. Why? Are we going to have white street lights instead of tungsten street lights? Do we want it to be harsh and scary, or do we want this character to be walking down a familiar neighborhood road? The process of making a mood board is finding stills or clips that you are that you want to do yourself. Once you understand the script, you can move into um, pre-production, which is where you, if you're producing it, or if you are a director with a producer, you start bringing in all of these people. The first person you need to bring in is obviously the cinematographer. Because the cinematographer is going to move this script from words on a page to a, sh a storyboard and a shot list, and then you are both going to work together to make that into a film. Very important to get a great cinematographer who is not only you know, gonna be good with the camera and the light, but who you get on with. Because I have worked with cinematographers who are brilliant, but you maybe don't see eye to eye on a certain thing. And if you, if you don't have the time to, you know, discuss these differences, you're just making a movie, um, you can have some flare ups and things, and it's up to you how patient you wanna be with people, but sometimes you have to stand up for your, you know, values. Um, so bringing in somebody who you have the same values with at the beginning is going to be very uh, helpful. But it's also interesting to work with people who are, you know, completely different and you, you learn some things. Okay, and then what you want to do is you're going to bring in a producer. So a producer is somebody who does the admin of the short film. They're going to corral the troops, send out forms, ask for permission, um, and help you write a schedule for your shoot days. 
So of course you have cinematographer, the producer, the actors, and you can make a film just like that. But of course, if you want to make it look good, then you're going to need some assistance. Now, a makeup artist is going to go a long way and they will handle things that you didn't even consider. Um, you think that you're going to make a scene where somebody gets hurt and it's just going to look great because you're going to put like some ketchup on it. But uh, you need somebody who really understands color and color science um, and how to make a face look tired or like they've just woken up. These things are going to make your short film look perfect. And then you can bring in an assistant director. If you have lots of extras on the shoot day, um, it's quite difficult to manage the producer, the cinematographer, all of the lead actors. It's good to have somebody else you can turn to who understands the script, who understands the film, and can tell the extras what to do while you're doing other things. And then what you do is you shoot the thing. So this is production. You have a couple of shoot days or maybe just one and this is gonna be probably one of, like some of the best days of your life, definitely. It's always been the best day of my life, uh, making a film. So part of being a director is answering questions. You show up on a film set and you answer questions until you leave. And it's great, it's really fun. Um, but you need to understand these, que these answers before you go. And this is what pre-production is about, it's about who are these characters? What are they trying to do? What's the goal of the scene? What, why is the light going to be red? You know, why are we shooting it at nighttime or in a, in, instead of in the morning? And people are going to see that this is, you know, this doesn't make sense. And, and now you've brought, you know, maybe 20, 30 people into your idea, into your brain, and you need to be able to say, no, no, it makes sense because of this reason. And this is important to tell people why you're doing things. Don't just be you know, a dictator and say, no, it's gonna be fine, it's my way. Don't worry about it. We're gonna do it like this. You need to tell people, even if it's just an extra or somebody who's giving you a hand, they're not like the cinematographer or, you still need to say, no, it makes sense because this character's motivation is to hurt this other person or to betray this person. So we have a red light and I know it's cliche, but it's gonna be cool. And then you have the post-production of the film. You have spent these shoot days capturing the audio, capturing the video, and um, you move into the edit. So it's up to you if you want to bring on an editor, a color uh, grader, and pass the footage to them. I personally edit all of my short films because I love editing. What you'll find is that the film will come together quite quickly. You will do the cutting, and the cutting is very quick. You just put the clips in the right place, um, and what takes a long time, as you probably know, is the Pareto principle. It's the 80-20 rule. So you spend 80% of the time fixing 20% of the product. And you know, you can do 20% of the time doing the edit, which is very quick, and then you, you, you move into things like sound design, color grading, mu writing the music. So yeah, sound is gonna be your best friend. So make sure that when you're uh, <laughs> when you're when you're on set you get you get more than enough sound so when it comes to distribution you need to build a press kit now this is a document that showcases a brand in a sense the brand being your short film and your story so as with all things you need to condense that brand into its simplest form figure out the color of your short film figure out the typography and figure out the content of this press kit. And this, this press kit can be you know, taken to social media platforms, to emails, and to production houses and film festivals. I commissioned a, uh, my friend Kane, a graphic designer, to make a press kit for this film. It is a lot of text, really. It's a lot of like giving context to the film um, to inspire people to maybe um, use it in their film festivals or in another distribution sense. And what I found with uh, the last point, the film festivals, is if you call the people who are running the festival and you ask them questions, then you will save yourself a lot of money. Because if you send out your short film to a film festival, you have to pay them money to watch the film. 
But if you call them and you say, hey, this is kind of my film, do you think that maybe uh, your, your festival will be interested in it? Then yeah, because they are incentivized to encourage you to submit the film even if the criteria is not going to be uh, what they want because they're gonna get $100 out of you and they'll watch your film and they'll um, they'll say, sorry, it didn't, it didn't work out. So if you call them first and you just try and make sure that your film has more of a chance than it seems, then you'll save some, some money. Or you can just put it on um, YouTube and uh, say goodbye. And that is the whole short film process. So how do you write a script for a short film? For me, I have been lucky enough to be keeping a journal for a long time now, maybe five years. I think how I started making short films is that I used my diary or my journal to tell stories. That's very well, that's okay, but I mean, that story is not necessarily gonna be a good short film. If we look at my most recent film, uh, After Work, the story is based on a true story because it happened to me in Edinburgh. Why are you looking at me? Creep! Creep! <laughs> and so this was very easy to take to my journal and say, this was crazy, wow, I can't believe this happened. And then maybe six months later I go, that could actually be a movie. So this is one way of doing the, you know, the idea conception. But now you have this idea and you have a blank page. What you need to do, or what or you don't need to do, you don't need to do it, but what I suggest is make a skeleton. So if you can write a few lines at the top of the page that say, you know, bartender walks home from work, bartender runs into drunken couple, Drunken couple have an accident and the bartender saves them. If you can see, okay, this makes sense. There's actually some tension here where he's seeing some strangers and then they have an accident and then he says, I'm gonna save the day. If you can look at that and you can go, okay, that is the film. Then you have a script because now you have a skeleton. You can drag all of that down onto many different pages and just write, you can go, what did it look like when he saw them? What did they say when he saw them? How did he save them? You know, you just wanna dr like drag out all of those details. Some people say when you make a short film that you shouldn't be poetic, it shouldn't be prosaic, it should just be blunt because what you're eventually gonna be doing is converting this piece of paper into ideas that are shared among many different department heads like the editor, the cinematographer, the producer, the actors, it needs to be like, this is the thing in its most simple form. But when I write a short film, I always throw in a bit of uh, descriptive writing, creative writing, because I love adjectives. Um, and so it's up to you if you wanna you know, bring the people who are gonna read the script into the world, or you wanna tell them the simplest story. Now there's a couple of different ways to do it. The first, the first movie uh, that I really wrote and that was really good because it got accepted into a film festival was this movie called Diomed and I watched the masterclass myself, uh, Werner Herzog, as I said before. And what he suggested, and I'm just stealing his ideas now, but it's a good idea, is if you play music for three hours, Beethoven's Ninth, have it on repeat for three hours, and you say to yourself, I'm gonna write a movie now then in three hours time you will have a movie. So that's a pretty cool exercise that you could do as well. But for me, it's about going out into the world and seeing simple things that could be stories on film or video. What is A role and B role? Now you might think that A role is a close up of your lead actor and B role is an establishing shot of the countryside but it might be the reverse. The A roll is the skeleton of the story. It's those bits in the script which are actually telling the next step. The B roll is those adjectives in the script. Um, you know, it was a mercurial cloudy day instead of it was gray. These things are going to just 
add weight to the short film. So I have an example here. I made a film called Blue Eyes in Edinburgh and nobody should ever watch that movie. But basically what happened is we filmed this kind of cool scene inside of a flat, inside. But we never took a video of the outside of the flat. And so the movie just begins with a conversation. And we didn't really understand at that time that to move from one flat to the other and to cheat what we say inside the flat, we made two different uh, houses. One was purple, one was beige, and we thought this was enough to show, okay, he's, he's moved from one house to another. And we thought, oh, you know, the establishing shot of the flat from the outs from the street will be B-roll, but we never actually filmed it. And in that case, it was A-roll because it was saying the story has moved location and because of that, we're gonna meet new characters. So it's very important when you're in pre-production and you're writing that shot list, you have your A-roll at the top and you say, these are the things we cannot leave the shoot day without. And the B-roll is, if we get all of this, then we can now do this. And that's that. So in order to make a short film, you're gonna need some equipment. I'm gonna tell you something you already know, which is, it's not about the equipment. The only thing you need to make a short film is a good microphone and a camera. The camera doesn't have to be good. Um, and then you need some action in front of the camera. This is the Sony a7S II, quite affordable little camera here, probably about 1000 USD four years ago. So you could probably pick this up for, for very little now. This is great because it's really small, um, but the image quality is bad for a short film. But if you want to just get the film made, then you might need a smaller camera and you don't want to carry around like a big, um, a big annoying um, camera. I think the lesson I've learned with uh, cameras in particular is going to the camera store and holding it and you know taking some videos with it. Is it intuitive? for you. It's not about, you know, what the reviews say, it's about how you work with the camera. The next thing um, that you need on a short film is a good light. Um, you're gonna need maybe three or four or five lights, but having uh, a very good key light, a, a powerful key light, is just going to compete with the sun and um, illuminate any nighttime scene and turn it in and turn it from an amateur film to something that's perfect because as you probably know already if you're watching this the exposure triangle iso aperture and shutter speed um, needs light you don't want to have that iso really high and get a grainy image so buy a big or don't buy but but you know rent out a good light the other thing that you'll need is of course a microphone this thing that we're using to record this film here today is a Zoom H5 and I bought this when I was 18 and that is uh, seven years ago now. So this thing was like quite expensive for me when I was 18, it was like 500 bucks New Zealand dollars. But I kind of knew a good microphone, it's the sort of thing that doesn't really age. Unlike a camera, a camera is always being updated you know, you get, you get 1080p. I remember when 1080p came out and then they go, oh, we got 4K, oh, we got 8K, we got 12K. And you're going, well, I got to get rid of my camera now. No, not necessarily. You can have a 1080p film and people will understand the film. If you don't have a good microphone, then it's going to be, no one's going to watch it. It's going to be, it's going to be hard for the viewer to get into that world without a good microphone. There are a million little bits and pieces that you need um, to make a short film. Okay, this is a, an unorthodox piece of equipment. This is a notepad. Um, I was in the uh, cadet forces for 10 years and having the ability to write down your instructions and give it to somebody and say, give this to somebody or take this with you so you know how to get to the place, to the car, to the batteries, you know, this is really useful. It also acts as a white balance, so you can put it up in front of the camera, check the white balance. So some more thoughts on gear. I'm using the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. 
you know, I'm about to go uh, on a trip to Massachusetts and I'm kind of thinking maybe I should bring this one because it's about a third of the size and has better battery life. But I am going to try and work with this new camera because it creates a beautiful, beautiful image and it's very intuitive. But I also have some other uh, things that I always bring onto film onto a film set. So the first thing I want to talk about is a little multi-tool. Uh, a film set is a is a place where things go wrong. So having a pair of pliers and a little knife is actually incredibly useful. You need to have a roll of tape. Um, people are going to walk in front of you and you say, this is where I want you to stand. You need to have a little marker. You don't just want to grab random pieces of um, objects. You need to have a piece of tape. A lens cleaning cloth. Um, I didn't really understand how brilliant these are until uh, I did a, a film and the sensor had dust on it and in every single shot you have these two grey marks in the video. Awful. I have the 50mm Canon. This is a very cheap affordable lens. Um, about a hundred bucks. Makes the face look very authentic and organic but it is quite close. Uh, so it's hard to do handheld stuff with 50 mil, which is why I have this 35 mil. Um, beautiful, uh, also authentic uh, face for your subject and uh, easier to do handheld things with. And then I have a 11 to 16 mil, which is just here. This was uh, a lucky buy on Trade Me. Um, it was about $200 bit of a steal. So cinematography, the juxtaposition is handheld versus the tripod. We use the tripod in the bar scenes and we use the handheld on the street because I wanted to show that the character was secure in his environment in the bar and then in the street he's a little bit more wary. Don't just go out and get a steady cam because it's going to be really beautiful because it might not look, it might not be authentic for what the story you're trying to tell is. So that's probably the number one thing to remember with uh, with all gear is it's only necessary if it brings your viewer closer to the story. So how much does it cost to make a short film? It depends how much you pay people. The best product either comes from good pay or a very inspiring individual or purpose. So the short film that I just made is probably gonna cost $3,000 maybe. Check the books. Now that's actually New Zealand dollars, so that's 1.6. So it's probably about 2.15 US dollars. Now, Mateus, the cinematographer, he did it completely for free. That was an insane stroke of luck. The guy has done Netflix documentaries. He's done Netflix dramas. Um, he's done his own web series. And I would not have worked with him if he wasn't quarantining in New Zealand. All of the actors had been out of acting school for a number of years and they had never made a short film. I didn't know this when I did the casting, I just asked people to come. Um, but they obviously haven't um, felt the need to get paid because they, they recognize that it's an important opportunity for them. Some people, they didn't talk about money, I didn't talk about money, and they did an amazing performance and I don't know how they would have done a better performance. So this is the thing to, to talk about or to not to talk about really with all of your crew and cast. But I think in my next short film, the lesson that I will have take from this one is to just talk to everybody about that um, so that we're all on the same page and that you probably will get a better film because of it. All right, so now I'm just gonna show you um, into the edit. Currently on the screen we have the Premiere Pro cut. When I edited after work, I used Premiere Pro to just do the editing only, and then I took that um, export into DaVinci Resolve, and we worked in DaVinci to create this uh, color grade that's on top. It's probably a third more cropped in. Because it was shot in 6K, we could do that, um, and that was that was pretty awesome. The The thing that you, you don't think about really, I guess, is the sound. Um, it doesn't look like much, but Everything in here is, you know, a, a decision. And those decisions were, you know, added and taken away many times. Reshot, audio, getting the Foley um, it took quite a long time. But yeah, it results in, a, in, in, a, in an atmosphere that can bring your viewer in 
uh, a lot more than just a visual can. The first rule for editing is to actually just have a purpose. So going through and doing a pass is a really useful thing to do. Just saying, okay, for the next 30 minutes, I'm just going to focus on the Foley. I'm just going to focus on the dialogue. I'm just going to focus on the extras in the scene. What are they actually doing? Does it make sense? That way you can just save a lot of time instead of just kind of pressing play and being like, oh, this is just heaps of fun. I'm editing, uh, I'm changing things, I'm making decisions. It's creative, it's fun, but it's not really efficient. And you're not focusing on one holistic vision. If you can focus on those individual visions um, one at a time, then they're all going to be tighter and more fresh and compelling than if you were to try and do them all at once. The other thing that I <laughs> that I wish I did in this, so you learn from this mistake, is labeling all of your audio files. I was going to lie for the screen capture and just label them, but I wanted to share the mistake that I made. So yeah, having each of these audio files as dialogue, music, foley, um, background, room tone, and music. Because when I worked with Matt Neal on this to make the music, we began mixing all of this audio, which is just the audio without the music. And God, it would have been easier uh, if they were labeled because uh, we, had to, we had to go through each clip here and move them into layers. Uh, and the same can be said for the visual layers as well, like having color coding. I color code other things, um, like when I make a corporate video, color coding the interview, the B-roll, uh, any sort of montage sequence or graphics. Color coding is great for that. But for this, I, I was like, oh, I don't really need to do that. I kind of know where everything goes. It's all in my head. And I didn't really have a problem with that. It, it might be better to color code it, but I, I didn't really need to for this one. One thing that I that I liked to do in this in this um, film was cut on action. So I used the extras in this to do that. Looking to the background for when was right to cut um, is a really subtle sort of thing to do instead of like waiting for something to be done. You know, somebody's like smashing a glass on the on the bar top. You can just cut right there. It's a nice subtle way to do it. So with this one here, it's kind of that idea where I cut as the motion stops. If we were to drag this clip out, he's going to bring it back up and down and back up and down, but it's just all the way to the bottom. And then he's going to bring it back up. So we cut. Simple. People have short attention spans, so I wanted it to be one thing to the next to the next to keep people's attention. And originally I started the film with this lady here, Bess Fairfax. This was the first shot was just the piss dribbling from her and then her shouting. But then the thing is, is like you want to set up the film to focus on the lead character. You know, who is this guy? What is the story? It's his story, you know. So the shots have to bleed into each other. So we decided to bring it back to this shot, which actually uh, my DOP Mateus just decided randomly after we shot uh, another scene just to get Bailey sitting on the bed looking out the window. We then created this whole intro where he's getting a rejection from a exhibition. But that being said, I'm still being incredibly concise with the information that we're showing. So it's just rejection, his reaction, he's now walking. And I've cut this down from like eight seconds to two or eight seconds to, yeah, it's two seconds. And then we go into Bess. My original idea when I wrote the script was this is the first shot and then you see him. He's walking to work. But who is this guy, you know? So it's a balance between cutting and cutting and cutting and trimming everything and making it seamless and making it fast paced and engaging and actually drawing it out and saying this is important, even if it's not very interesting. Because, you know, a, sh a shot of a guy sitting on a bed looking out the window, it's it's not very interesting. It's kind of cliche. I was very worried about having that as like one of the first shots because I'm like, people aren't going to watch this, you know. But at the same time, it's it's about building that character. You you wanted to you want your viewers to get into the head and the feet of your characters. And then there's the music, which I love. I walked to work one day and I did actually see a lady who looked just like Bess pissing onto the street, 10 a.m. in the morning, broad daylight. And uh, that was kind of shocking for me. Uh, I looked at her 
She didn't actually shout at me. That's a bit of poetic license. But um, I did stand on the street and stare at her for a while. And I was just kind of bewildered. And then I walked to work. And um, it colored my day for sure. It was, a, it was a strange experience. So having that straight away kind of sets the tone for the film. Then we have another decision. Bailey focusing on Bailey. Even though I want to show the chaos of the bar, I still want to show it through Bailey's eyes. So he's in every single shot in uh, this montage sequence. You can see his white shirt in the background of most shots, or he's in the front of the frame. What I, I wanted to say was, you know, alcohol destroys lots of things. And me as a bartender, like I drank so much alcohol, it was crazy. And I kind of wanted Bailey to drink alcohol too, but then I explicitly also wanted it to be anti-alcohol. So I was towing the line there between capturing him slowly you know degenerating into an alcoholic or you kind of have him on a moral high ground saying i'm just this is just my job i'm not actually going to indulge like the customers are which kind of makes the ending a bit better uh, he's just a, a bit he's further removed from it he's not a hypocrite because he doesn't drink so we tried to create chaos in the edit by just keeping it real fast, keeping it sharp. And, and I do add in like smashed um, bottle sound effects like mic being dropped, people shouting, laughing to kind of build that chaos that we didn't really do when we shot the film. Bailey takes a breath. This is like a little light motif in the movie of him after, you know, being with people, he takes a breath. And then we can see him here noticing the couple. So when this actually happened to me, I was with a friend and we both intuitively crossed the road to help these people. But I wanted the character here to be alone and face the problem by himself. Okay, a little tip for you. Know exactly how long the makeup is going to take because we're trying to fake here that this is like six in the morning. We did, we did meet up at that time. And the makeup took like two hours and we ended up shooting these shots far later in the day than I would have liked, which is fine. But, um, you know, Mateus color graded this and made this fake sun here to kind of fake that it's uh, early morning. So I edited this scene a couple of different ways. Um, originally, it was like mainly the wide shot because I wanted to show Bailey taking the keys, going up the stairs, running down the stairs. But then I realized I could actually just do that storytelling with sound effects. So in this next shot, uh, he's down the stairs and helping uh, Gary here. Just did that with sound effects of, the, of him running on the staircase. You can do a lot of that in filmmaking, just sort of subtly giving people information and it doesn't really matter if they don't even pick up on it because you're moving the story forward. This was a a scene in the film where these two actors are really reacting from each other, especially Bailey is reacting from David because the true story here that happened to me was a lot more aggressive and I was very scared because I walked into this guy in the bus stop, he started asking me if I wanted to have a fight and I had to sort of try and be confident and say, I'm just catching the bus, leave me alone. And he was just really drunk and aggressive. So here's a little cut. Falling, um, this is, you know, we just wanted to show that the bartender comes home. He has a very, very brief period of time where he's alone and he can rest. But we don't even let that happen on camera. He falls. And as he falls, we cut to the rubbish bin. It's, it's the same angle. Um, and he's, he's putting rubbish in the bin in his work uniform, and then he's at the bar. You know, he doesn't really have any time to rest. That scene was a bit, uh, my, you know, my brother, uh, he watched this film a lot, and he said that we should take out this uh, white shot because it's too different from the black bedroom to the red bar. It's too jarring. And maybe he's right. Um, 
But for me, I really just loved the little idea of him sleeping in the rubbish bin and getting to work. Because in my experience as a bartender, when you get home from a really long shift, you play over these things in your mind. You, you serve customers, you uh, clean the bar top, you carry things, and you can't really get to sleep, and it's like kind of horrible. So just, yeah, showing people that you don't really have a break is what that shot is doing. And it's obviously very subtle, and you probably didn't even see that. You'd only get that through like analysis or something. But it's just these little impressions on the audience that can hopefully, you know, make a, um, a holistic and clear vision. Speaking of clear visions, the scar on Megan's head there is an absolute mistake on my part. So yeah, the thing I learned with the makeup is to really, you know, actually understand the vision. I told Narul um, that we wanted her to have, you know, a day old cut on her head, but I didn't tell her that we're gonna need a bandage um, because it just looks, it just doesn't make any sense that you would go out in public without covering this up. So that's just a mistake that I made and hopefully you don't make that mistake too. Just think about what would be realistic um, when it comes to makeup. So what we did in the edit really is just to crop in to try and cover that. Uh, you can see that the, the full shot is, cover is up here, but we just cropped it in to cover that up a bit. You can have a massive short film, you can have a tiny short film with two people or 300 people, but at the end of the day, the most important thing when it comes to filmmaking is communication. You must be able to tell somebody else what's in your mind, politely, quickly, and inspirationally. You wanna help, you wanna get people working for you so you need to be very nice and energetic. Uh, so I have a couple of examples. Uh, I worked with Jason um, Statham on uh, the Meg movie. I was in a scene with Jason Statham and he's like a big, he's a big actor, you know. And he, I mean, maybe he watches this, I don't know, but he won't remember me. But he, uh, <laughs> he was, he was mad. Uh, we, we were filming in a submarine and uh, it was very cold, very uh, wet. And the producer and the director, they were coming in and they were saying, okay, are you okay? Are you ready? You're ready. Uh, I was ready, you know? And then J uh, they said, okay, Jason, come in. And uh, he came in and somebody wasn't ready. Like somebody had to do one more thing, you know, maybe 20 seconds, 30 second thing. And he said, oh, and he started swearing at everybody and he left. And then the director was like, oh, damn. And then he came back literally to like 30 seconds later. Like he, he was like, okay, I'm not doing it. I'm not gonna do it now. You guys, need to, you guys need to fix your problems. And then I will be back. And then he was back like 20 seconds later. And it was just like, okay, big guy. Um, <laughs> but he also maybe like, he's, he's probably, he's a great actor and maybe he knew what he was doing. I have found on my short films that if anybody is like that, if it's an actor, uh, a crew member, or even a member of the public, the directors and the producers on that big feature film probably did the right thing and they didn't argue with him. They just let him have his tantrum. Uh, he was probably stressed, it was a big production. Um, and then they said, come back when you're ready. And you know, you have a little bit of leeway there. If you have one minute, two minutes, five minutes, that's okay. Maybe if, if it's turning into 30 minutes, then people are getting paid and it's a waste of time. This happened to me on a short film where I was directing a actor and we were doing a, a gun scene and he wanted to bring his own prop for a pistol. And I said, no, it's okay, I have, I have a pistol already. He still brought the pistol and he insisted on the shoot day that he use it. And I said, okay, fine, you know, you can, you can use your own pistol. <laughs> and um, he gave it to the sound engineer to hold and the sound engineer dropped the pistol and it broke the magazine and he was pissed. <laughs> he was very upset. And it actually wasn't me that, that solved the problem. Even though I was the director, I should have, I should have said something. I didn't really know what to do, but my director of photography taught me a lesson that day. 
it's okay, I just looked it up. Uh, these magazines are $100 and me and Connor are gonna pay for it and it doesn't matter, we'll sort it out later. Let's continue the shoot. Just like that, fast, simple, everybody understood what was gonna happen and he felt a little bit better and we moved on. So it doesn't matter if you're on a big film or a very, very small film, you need to be able to uh, communicate politely, succinctly and inspirationally. You have to stick to your guns. If you write a film, then you should, you should, you should uh, maintain that idea all the way through the process. Don't, don't let yourself change it and don't let other people change it. Um, it's definitely good to have collaboration, but you collaborate on the idea, then you make the movie. You don't collaborate on the idea and then collaborate on the idea and then collaborate on the idea. You wanna keep it the same the whole time. Okay, so where do you get your inspiration from? As a filmmaker, as a short filmmaker, you are a storyteller. You're an artist who is trying to make people walk away from the film experience, the viewing experience, with a certain emotion or message. So that emotional message or experience that people have when they watch your film needs to come from somewhere. Now. That can be an adaption of a play, or it can be a conversation that you had with somebody on the bus. But I think you find these stories once you understand that you can actually take these stories. You know, Pablo Picasso, he said, uh, a great artist doesn't copy, they steal. And it's true. For many years, when I was you know, a teenager, I was like, how do you come up with an idea, how do you make a story? Then, you know, you have an experience and you say, that was really interesting and I learned something. So maybe I could take that experience that I had, you know, film it with audio and video and then people can watch that experience and they can kind of connect to what you felt originally. So my answer is probably, that I find inspiration from real life. Because in real life, that's where we're gonna get those real emotions from people. Fear, jealousy, anxiety, neuroticism, inspiration, moments of pure bliss. These don't just come from reading other people's stories or looking at people's paintings or watching other people's films. It comes from being scared, being neurotic having a moment of paranoia um, or, or doing something that you didn't want to do or doing something that you really loved, um, those are the things that you, that you can then, you know, transpose onto a film. I also think that, you know, David Lynch has some good things to say here. Um, as, a, as, a, as a filmmaker, you're a storyteller, right? So delving into all kinds of art forms, if you have the time, is going to enhance that movie. If you can mess around with a camera, if you can do a drawing, uh, do a painting, if you can take a walk and appreciate the sounds of birds, these sorts of things are gonna help you to understand how, how you're experiencing the emotions that you are, and also it's gonna help you to you know, convey that information to other people. It's easy to get bogged down and you know, overwhelmed by all of this information. I think if you just take a note from the script writing part of this, write something down, make it simple, go and make it. You will learn a lot just from doing that. You can do that in an afternoon. And you will, in the evening, look at the footage and you'll say, I could change this in a million ways. Now, what are those ways? That's the growth that you've just had in that afternoon. And that's beautiful. Hopefully, there's been some growth from watching this. Thank you for taking the time to watch this. You can find me at straypath.co.nz or Connor Kerr Lewis on Instagram. Good luck, take care of yourself, take care of your community, take care of the environment, and tell 
your story.